you you said that the that Bakari Dabo, the the NSS bodyguard who was with you, was having conversations with his boss. Who yes. was his boss at this time? His boss was Keba Sise, who was the Director General of the National Security Service. Do you know whether Keba Sise briefed Sardauda while he was in London? No, he hasn't. Uh, can you tell us how the decision was taken uh, for the for the group, Sardauda's entourage, to return to Gambia? Well, as per protocol, normally the, protoc the protocol officer is the one who is responsible for all our itinerary. You know, for, for me, all I need to be told is this is the time we're traveling. This is the time we're traveling, and then the, uh, the, uh, the orderlies will, uh, and that particular incident was by Bakari Kamara they'll be responsible for the luggage. So as far as I'm aware, it's just a normal, you know, standard operational procedure. So we just uh, uh, get ready to leave. So tell us, uh, from your part, did you have any suspicion? Absolutely th that not. That anything was going on in Gambia? Absolutely. I had no inkling whatsoever. If I had had any suspicion, my, my own, uh, because I had devised my own uh, SOP, uh, if I have any uh, inkling coming from the army, I used to call, I would call RSM Jeng at the camp and to get a feedback exactly, what is this true or something like that, then I'll get an assessment, yeah, but then if it is something like just hot air, you know, I'll just take it as that, you know. Well, why would you call RSM Jeng? He was not the commander of the army. No, because uh, I know by virtue of his appointment and then uh, by virtue of the responsibility he had, you know, there wouldn't be anything happening within the camp without his knowledge. So I said, uh, uh, and he can always find out if there was something. So he would be the right person to me, not necessarily the commander. You know, and of course I had an interpersonal relationship with him. We both work at the training school together. You know, so and I had that develop. Uh, you wouldn't call it friends, but it was very professional relationship we had. You know, so I could trust his judgment. Uh, if there's something going amiss, and then he would definitely pass it on to me. So I didn't find any cause whatsoever to call anybody, because I wasn't uh, the least aware of whatever was happening back home. On the part of Sadauda, did you see anything that would suggest to you? that he may have received some information about what was happening in the Gambia at the time? Absolutely not. So is it your view that you came back to Gambia blindly, not knowing what was going on at all? Completely blind, completely blind. Absolutely. So kindly tell us what happened when you arrived in Gambia. On the 22nd, uh, when, we came, when we came, you know, to me it's a normal routine. Like I said, in the aircraft, I would sit behind the president. Whenever I so going to the toilet, I would escort him, coming back, sit down, just make sure he goes smoothly to and fro. So of course, this time, the president travels commercial. Uh, yeah, even the commercial, I do that. You know, in every, uh, he always travels commercial. And then uh, I will always be uh, there in uniform so I can be recognized in case he's going to visit the, uh, uh, the bathroom. So I will escort him and then, uh, yeah, he's easily recognizable there. So he's always, he's always traveled commercial, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah, so we arrived at, uh, and, and normally the protocol is when you arrive, the plain clothes security will go out secure the area and then the deputy uh, the deputy chief of protocol will come and invite the president to come down meeting the chief of protocol you know said is the president ready you know i'll make sure when he's ready and then he's ready then yeah, so they will lead the way and i'll follow behind so we come down the foot of the plane so yeah, yeah we come down on the foot of the plane and then you have the uh, uh, the receiving party you know they'll line up and then we'll shake hands before we go to the dais to take the national salute. And then uh, from there on, we did a guard inspection where he'll go 
outside and inside the ranks of the soldiers, and then come back, take the salute, and that's it, uh, we head towards the cars. I wasn't aware of absolutely, I didn't see anything, and uh, only, the only thing there were fewer people normally uh, than uh, sometimes, usually normally you, have a, you can have a big entourage, I mean, of people coming to receive the president. But beyond that, you know, I have absolutely no inkling of uh, anything I miss or whatsoever. It's, it's a normal thing to me, the way I see it. You know, my eyes, we are fixated on the president, that's all. But, yes, everything appeared normal. Normal to me, yeah. But did you subsequently realize that there were some anomalies? Well, I know the vice president wasn't there. Uh, he was there to normally, and he's in the country. He should be the person to receive the president. Uh, if he is out of the country, then the next uh, senior in terms of uh, ministerial responsibilities, uh, being the, uh, the minister of justice, I would, I would uh, assume that responsibility and then receive uh, the president. Like in this particular case, uh, Asan Jalo was there, uh, who received him. So the vice president wasn't there. I have no idea where he was. You know, whether he was out of the country or in the country, I actually have no idea at that time, you know, that he was in the country. And uh, from the airport, where did you go next? From the airport, normally we'll head back to State House. And then the protocol will, had always been an arrival at State House. Uh, the president will go to his drawing room, and then the vice president, who should be uh, there to brief him about what transpired in the country, uh, virtually handing over co command control, what has uh, happened in his absence, you know, provide a briefing note. So this may take about half an hour to one hour while over they're having a tea, and then uh, before he retires. On this particular occasion, uh, when we got to the drawing room, and he paused, and then we we're looking back to receive Asan Yalo. So what well, he said, where is Asan? I said, I don't know, he's not coming. So I just went downstairs, I, I inquired. But they, some said, at the time, they said he branched off around uh, Westfield. You know, well, I came over, I said, well, I came and report to him exactly what happened. Uh, he didn't come with us, so he branched off from West, Westfield Johnson. Some said sitting corner. So, so I told the president, he just shrugged his shoulders and he went in. He didn't say anything? Yes. No, he didn't say anything. So. Uh, you can only, I don't want to guess, you know, maybe he didn't know his role, that, that particular role, whether he's been briefed properly. That's what's supposed to happen. I don't know. So. And did you remain at State House for the rest of that evening? Until everybody clears, you know, so I headed back uh, to my residence, which was at, uh, next to Radio Gambia, mile seven. And while at mile seven, did you have occasion to talk to anybody? I had, uh, I think Turo, Turo uh, spoke to me, Turo Jaune, and then he told me about this uh, supposed demonstration still, that uh, they suspected uh, uh, Ya Jame to be involved. And then he said, uh, he put his mind- in, To be involved in what? Uh, to, be in, to be leading this uh, particular demonstration in, at the airport. You know, of course, uh, that's how it was put to me from uh, London. So I assume it's still the same demonstration and he's talking about. So he told me that, uh, and he put his man, uh, that is uh, Alaji Martin, uh, to mark him that if he's up to anything, he will be dealt with summarily. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, what rank was Alaji Martin at the time? I think he must have been sergeant. I'm not very sure, but he must have been sergeant. So it is your testimony that that night Turo Jaune told you that there was going to be a demonstration yeah. led by Yaya Jame at the airport and he as head of state guards. No, he, not head of head state of guards. He was TSG. the head of the TSG. Put his own man, being Sergeant Alaji Martin, yeah. to mark Yaya Jame. Yeah. Just in case Yaya Jame did anything, he would be dealt with summarily. That's what he told you. Yes. Did you ask him any questions about that event? I, I, I didn't. Uh, I, so, uh, I just assumed you know, that, was the end of, that was the end of it. You know? So, yeah, we just came from a, a long trip. So I just wanted to 
uh, retire, you know, so, and I said, it basically explained to me that was it. So I didn't have any inkling, you know, all that has transpired with, uh, down there or, or whatever else which I came later to know about. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's 10 minutes to the break. Uh, I leave it at that for now for the commissioners to ask questions if they have any. Thank you very much, Chairman Council. Um, I think we probably should just take the 30 minute break and uh, uh, come back. And if we have any questions, we'll wait for the end of the testimony yeah. and see if we can In do that. In that case, I can just continue and take the 10 minutes. Oh, fine. If you want to use of the 10 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and go, please go ahead. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So that night, you went to bed thinking that everything was okay, correct? Yes, I had uh, already uh, planning ahead on the 22nd, because on the 22nd we were meant to have uh, uh, received the Chinese ambassador who was meant to present his letters of credence. He's a new ambassador. So that's the only program I had that I was looking forward to. You know, so apart from that, I have no uh, suspicion or whatever had happened in the country. No, I have no idea. And uh, what happened the next day? Uh, the next day in the morning, naturally, I, you, I got dressed in my ceremonial uniform, you know, because I'm going to have a guard of honor. So when I came to State House, uh, went to, I, I walked through State House, nothing abnormal. You know, you have the two sentries, you know, at uh, uh, the gate, at the gate I normally entered through was from the uh, hospital end. You know, so from there, of course, you come naturally first to the guard commander's uh, uh, office, which is just at the down, downstairs below the main state house building. So uh, that's where I walked to, and I found uh, Kababajo. They are standing with uh, Keba Sise. What position did Kababajo hold at this time? He was the, uh, the uh, commander of the pres presidential guards. What was his rank at the time? Uh, he was lieutenant. And uh, you said the other person was K. Basise, correct? K. Basise, yes. What position did he hold at this time? He was the Director General of the National Security Service, the NSS. And what happened there? Uh, then it was, uh, Kaba informed me that there had been some shootings at uh, Yundum Barracks. Uh, what time of the day was this? This must be around 8 o'clock because uh, the President will normally go uh, between 7 to 8, normally 8 o'clock after be there, ready to take him to uh, to the office. So it will be around that 8 o'clock time. Okay. And uh, yes, you were told uh, yeah, there the were disturbances at yeah, the Union Barracks. At the Union Barracks. I think I did attempt to call Union Barracks from there, but the phone was just ringing endlessly. No one was picking up the phone. And then uh, Keb and Kaba told me that Keba Sise, uh, he wanted to go and uh, brief the president about rumors of a coup. He had a, a folder in his hand. In a Do you know whether he, whether he did that? To my knowledge, uh, I wasn't aware when he was uh, when he went to. Uh, I wasn't present when he went to. Well, he went by himself. I didn't escort him because uh, my my first reaction was when he told me that. I was saying rumors of court. I mean, they're firing. That's it's, it's a bit late, if anything, to go and uh, uh, brief the president. But I, I didn't ask. I asked uh, Kaba what was uh, where is the vice president. He said the vice president is in his office, receiving guests from the uh, U.S. Lamore County frigate. Well, that again was like a news to me. But then, uh, 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 what was news to you? The fact that uh, there is uh, uh, a frigate here in the country, uh, uh, I didn't even know they were even for exercise. I didn't, at this point, I just know that he has uh, the president, had, the vice president has guests in his office. So he's the minister of defense at the same time. So a problem of this nature, I had to go to him first if he's there and then talk to him. Because he's the boss of my, uh, my, my boss, if you can call it, I mean the army commander. So naturally, I went to his office straight away. 
tell us what happened there. Uh, when I walked in and I said, uh, uh, I didn't even sit down. I just went straight to him. I could see everybody sitting around, you know, in their uniforms. And I said, uh, Who did you see? Uh, the vice president was there, Ambassador Winters was there, Andrew Winters. Plus the, from, uh, from which country? Uh, Andrew Winters was the ambassador of the uh, United States. Uh, yeah, he was there present, plus the command of the, uh, the frigate. They were, it was jam-packed. Uh, you can see everybody sitting down there. W w which frigate are we talking about and from which country? This is U.S. Lamar County. You know, I'm not sure exactly which country, I can't remember which country it was. From America, of course, but which state, I'm not sure was from America. And uh, they were in a meeting with uh, the vice president at the time? Yes, they were apparently talking about the same issue. So when I, when I came in, I said, well, I had this happen in the camp. Well, he but said- Tell us exactly what you told him and that, how he responded. Yeah, I told him, uh, I, understand that I was told that there are some shootings in the camp. He said, yes, we are aware, we are monitoring the situation. Yeah. Did he say anything else? No, I, I, I said, I remember at the time, I said, okay, uh, if, should it be necessary? At that, that point, I made that uh, initial suggestion. I said, should it be necessary to have the president on board their ship in, in case there is a need for it? I, I said that to, to when there are presidents down there, when everybody was sitting down there. Well, he said they are monitoring the situation. Then I left there and I came down. And when I came down, I met uh, Sam Sudin Sir. It was a staff officer, uh, our military staff officer at our uh, uh, the defense. What so, was his rank? Uh, he was captain, Captain Samsudin Sar. So I told him uh, the, the state house as it is now, most had they are preparing for a guard of honor. So there are virtually no guards here. It's quite, quite almost empty. If you can go to the marine unit and then uh, bring us some soldiers, to help bolster the security here while we try and assess the situation. I, I had a discussion with him, and he told me, uh, yeah, uh, they had about 50 millimeter caliber guns, you know, and then uh, he was really, uh, at that point, mad, you know, that uh, this thing is happening. Uh, I'll go and bring them, you know, using military explicit terms, you know, come and kick, kick this, uh, let's say, the backside of these soldiers or whatever they are up to. But then, uh, so he was meant to go to the marine unit. As far as the agreement I had with him, you know, to go and bring me more soldiers and then to come and help secure the state house. You said you told him that state house was virtually empty. Yeah. There were no security. Yeah. Well, not, not there were no security. They were, they, I assume at that time that they had gone to prepare for the guard of honor, which was meant to take place that, that, uh, that uh, uh, particular uh, particular day, the Chinese ambassador was meant to come. Uh, naturally, they should have been forming up when I get that early enough. They should have been there. There was no formation, no nothing there. So I didn't know exactly what had happened in their arrangements. So uh, that's why I told Sam, you know, I need uh, as a temporary measure if you can go to uh, the marine unit and bring us more soldiers and to come and help uh, secure the state house. Last question before the break. Was the security arrangement at that time normal, as far as you know? As, uh, as far as, the, you'll have the normal centers will be there. Yeah, no, the only abnormality down there was, I saw a uh, Kauso camera, we used to be commonly called as Bombardé, you know, had a, a bandolier of uh, uh, rounds, you know, wrapped around him like Rambo, you know, so. Uh, that, that kind of brought, even brought a chuckle to me. I would say one bullet, you know, you'll just be like a, a, a walking time bomb. But then, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't impressed, to be quite honest with you. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted uh, uh, the uh, Marine unit to come, you know, uh, soldiers I could actually command. In spite of the, in spite of uh, the fact that you were not impressed by his posture, not necessarily only him, you know, uh, at, and when this thing happened, you know, from the time I communicated, that's what I communicated with Kaba, and then I finished there, that was it. I said, I have to be in charge. I have to find a way of either securing the state house 
or securing the president. That become my, I went into kind of military mode, you know, command mode, if you can call it that. So to find some kind of solution, you know. You said you were not impressed by Bombardier's bravado as, yes. and his yes. posture. Uh, was it, wasn't it shocking that the State House was virtually devoid of security? Yes, uh, absolutely. It was eerily quiet, very, very, very quiet. You know, uh, very, very quiet, to be quite honest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we leave it at that, and we come back after the break. Thank you very much, Council, and thank you very much, Mr. Kasama. Uh, we will take a 30-minute break and come back at uh, 12 noon. Meeting is adjourned. Welcome back, Mr. Kasama. Uh, are you ready to proceed? Uh, yes, I just wanted to make some few observations I might have missed. Uh, in this particular, especially when, whilst I was standing on the terrace of the uh, State House, I was joined there by uh, Pamudu An, uh, who was uh, captain. Uh, he came from Liberia at the time, and he was visiting the State House this particular morning. And then uh, he told me, I, I informed him what was happening uh, by uh, the, uh, the army apparatus, uh, whether he's aware. But then he offered his service, should he be needed. So he was on the, at the same time, he walked into the state house then. Because he was just coming to the staff office, from, like, coming from Liberia. And then, of course, I also spoke to uh, Basiru Jahumpa, uh, who also found me there. And I explained to him. Uh, he was also lamenting the fact that, uh, uh, as in his own words, you know, these boys are coming to destroy the country. So uh, I thought I should make note of those things. Yes, before you proceed further, perhaps uh, we could just try to recap uh, what we talked about uh, before the break, uh, so that uh, we could set the pace for what is to come after. Okay. Uh, you indicated that the night before you arrived from London and nothing abnormal occurred at the airport. You went to State House. Sadauda inquired about the Minister of Justice who headed the visiting, par the receiving party, the welcoming party. And uh, you informed him that he wasn't present. Thereafter, Sadauda went up to his quarters. You went home. Thereafter, you received information from Mr. Turo Jaune, that there was to be a demonstration at the airport uh, that night, that day. Jaya uh, Jame was to lead it, but he placed his man, one Sergeant uh, Alaji Martin, to mark Jaya Jame just in case he tried to do any, something, and then he would be taken care of. And after that, you went to bed. The next morning, you went to State House because there was to be a Chinese ambassador who was to present his letters of credence. And uh, you found Kaba at the, at, the, at the State House together with the head of the NSS, and they informed you about disturbance that were going to happen. That is essentially what you talked about yes, so before the break, correct? Yes. <coughs> now, uh, you told us that you were told that when you asked about the vice president, you were told that he was upstairs receiving a delegation. Yeah. Uh, prior to that time, did you know whether a delegation of that nature uh, would be at State House? Absolutely not. At this stage, you were told that the vice president was receiving this delegation. Did you know what, does, what that delegation was to do in the Gambia? Absolutely not. As far as you know, was the president informed about, this, about the activity of this delegation? He said he was not informed. You subsequently discussed it with him? Yes. Uh, 
we would come back to that. So why did you go to the office of the vice president? Well, he's the Minister of Defense, and I was told he was in. And then, like I said, he's the, in, in my natural uh, office I would walk to, because being in charge of the defense of the country. And then uh, I was having these delegates from uh, uh, the, this warship, or if you call it, or the frigate. So I thought I should go and consult him first, because when I learned that he was in, very, he was actually in probably very early, because given that if I got down there by half seven, I got down there between half seven and eight, so he must have uh, uh, got there uh, well before I got there. So I, I thought I should go to him first and then uh, seek advice you know, and inform him according as well. Because I assumed that when I was going, I didn't even know he knew what was happening. So I was surprised that uh, he actually is well in the picture of what was happening as he informed me when I arrived there. Do you know how he came to know what was going on? No idea. He just told me they are monitoring the situation, so and that's it. I took his word for it. When you left the vice president's office, where did you go after that? I was on the terrace for the time being. I think after I spoke to Samsar, and then Pamudu An, then Jahumpa, I didn't see him walk past me to go to the president's uh, residence upstairs, which is opposite uh, the vice president's uh, office. You know, that's the current uh, residence of the president. So I decided it's about time to go to and talk to the president because I wanted to have a full grasp of the situation, you know, because I know the type of uh, uh, person I'm working with, Sadauda, so he would ask questions. So I gather all the information I can, then I decided to go to him. Uh, on my way there, first I saw Keba Sise, the Director General of National Security, coming from that end, from the President's bedroom end, the stairs coming out. And then while I was going up the stairs, I think when I met the Vice President coming down. And uh, he told me in, in Mandinka, he, he told me in Mandinka, Tadiam uh, Wilanyin Kebae, Akangojata Baki. You know. What does that mean? It means uh, this old man is very stubborn. I'm trying to take him to the boat as a, for, for a sanctuary, but he refused to go. I wasn't privy to the, that communication with, between him and the president. Did he say anything else? That's the only thing that he said. It, Did, see, he said, see whether you can convince him. Yeah. He gave me those instructions. See whether you can convince him. You go and talk to him and see whether you can convince him. So I said, okay, and I woke up. You know, when I got down there, I didn't ask him whether the vice president even spoke to you about this. I said, I told him, sir, I understand there is some disturbance in the camp. And then uh, there's a suggestion that you know, we should go to the uh, US boat while we assess the situation. And he kind of frowned at me. And he said, uh, what for? Well, I said, well, in the, the, as, as far as it's, it's con the camp is concerned now, we've been shootings down there, so we don't know the situation. At this point, I have no idea even whether it's a coup or not. So we started arguing. He said, he said, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm not going. He said, he's not going anywhere. I said, okay. I sat on his bed. There was a bedside phone. I called the Yundum barracks. It was ringing the whole time, just like at Kabas office. I couldn't get anybody on the phone. So I decided to uh, call uh, Colonel Akoji, who was the acting army commander. So acting army commander told me, uh, well, there are some disturbance at the camp. And uh, he said, uh, I have, uh, I think he mentioned Mamad Cham with him there. You know, so that's the situation at the moment. At around what time? Was this? I am. I am not. It's usually between eight and nine, around that, uh, around that time, around nine o'clock or so. You know. So he, he informed me. So I passed the message to him. I said, "Sir, you know." Uh, then I tried to start to rationalize with him that you know, the, there is no guard in the state house at the moment because they are preparing for uh, a guard of honor. 
it will be better if we can have a safe place while we assess the situation. He said, I'm not going anywhere, you know? So at that point, I left it at that, and I came down here again, tried to uh, wait for an outcome from Sam Sar, who had gone, to, I assume, then had gone to the Marine unit. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? Well, there was nothing forthcoming. You know, I decided to then now get information that, uh, you know, before I got the information, I came back again uh, for the second time, and I spoke to him, and uh, the same result, again, I called. You spoke to who? Sadawda, again. I, the same result that he's not going, I said, okay, let me call Colonel Akoji again. But this time, Colonel Akoji informed me, his, in, his message was very specific. He said, Kasama, I think there's a coup going uh, on the way. And then, uh, then he started narrating to me the installations or, or barracks taken by the soldiers. Uh, tell, tell us what he said. Yeah, what he, he was said. saying they've taken Union Barracks, uh, Bonto, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the telecom station down there, and they've taken uh, Fajara Barracks, and they've taken uh, Radio Gambia, and now they are at the bridge. You know, that's one second time I went down there. So when, that definitely that tells me exactly what's coming on the way. So I told the president this time, I said, look, sir, what he's, well, exactly what he told me, I, I relayed his message, that they believe it is a coup. And then uh, this is what the soldiers are involved in. And then I told him the names, uh, like he told me, the officers who went down there. At that point in time, his message was some of these officers said they are not part of it. Who told you yeah. that? Colonel Akoji, when I spoke to him. So he told me they said Which they are, officers did he mention to you? Uh, I think I, he mentioned Wilson was there. And then uh, I, I, I can remember Wilson and Mamat Cham at that time who were with him, you know, uh, and at his house, at his residence. And his suggestion to you was that these officers informed him that they were not part of the he, 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 yeah, not the, he said they made their way to, the, to him, indicating that they don't want to take part in this uh, particular uh, uh, whatever these people are up to, well, the coup. So he said that. And I informed that I, I uh, did Colonel Akoji told you at the time, did he tell you at the time? Yes, he did. Uh, who was involved in the coup? No, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't give me any names. I had, at that time, I had no idea who and who has been involved in what. He didn't give me a single name. He just, he just called them soldiers. You know, he didn't even say like officers also, he just said soldiers at the time he used. Apart from the briefing that you gave to Sadawda, do you know whether any other person uh, has given him a similar briefing? Like, I cannot say whether when Kebasisa went up, whether he actually got to the house or whether uh, the vice president actually got to him because I wasn't there when they were, what, what they claimed to have, what actually did not, did not Kebasisa, but the vice president claimed to have uh, communicated to him the idea of going to the board, which of course later on he was denied categorically that never happened. Who denied that? Sadawla. Tell us what he said. He said he was at no point did the vice president come to tell him that he should go to the board. But this was, this was the instruction I was given, you know, to go and said that he said he refused to go, so you better go and talk to him and try and see how you can convince him. That's the first point of departure in terms of uh, the communication. You know. So the second time you went to Sadada, you told him that this looks like a coup. They have come up to the bridge. Uh, what was his reaction this time? Still, in fact, uh, I think he sat down at that point. He just said, let them let come and get me. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I haven't done anything wrong. He said, they can come and get me. So it was like resigned to his fate, whatever was going to happen. Well, uh, at that point, I said, you know, it's, uh, his safety is my responsibility. Uh, if he's not going to move, I have to find another way to, for him to move. 
was it really your responsibility? You were just his ADC. You were not responsible for his security yeah, in the at, normal scheme of things. At, at, throughout this thing, at no point did I see the guard commander, I would say, make any effort, you know, to uh, either suggest a way of, uh, you know, improving the security within the state house or this is the action plan. So completely from the office, I lost track of him completely, to be quite honest with you. I lost track of him. Track of who? The, the, the commander of the presidential guard. Who was that? Yeah, Kababajo. I didn't know where he was, what he was doing, what he was communicating. I have no idea. So I felt I was on my own at that particular time. So I felt it's my responsibility then, you know, like a military soldier, I mean, a military officer, you know, I have to take responsibility and find a solution to this, a temporary solution. That was my belief at the time. Uh, as suggested by the uh, vice president. At this stage, where were the plain clothes officers and the bodyguards? Nobody around within. When I was moving, I haven't seen anybody around. You know, they could be downstairs somewhere, or they could be with uh, Kababaji. I didn't see anywhere. Nobody. When I was going up, I went there alone, coming down uh, alone, all by myself. What happened after you informed Sadauda? Yeah. The second time? The second, when, said, when he said he's not going, I just veered from his house. I went straight to a Lady Chile's house. I, I briefed her exactly what the situation is. That uh, Tell us what you told her. Well, I told, I told her about the disturbance in the camp. And that now our plan is now to take them to the, to the boat, uh, where it will be safe. I didn't even tell him that the president refused to go. You know, so I thought if I could get them to the cars, which we are laid down by the vice president, Arin, with the U.S. ambassador, because they already laid their uh, vehicles down, ready to depart, if and when the president decides to come, come down. So I said, well, the first thing, the best way to go about this, get the family out first, all the kids, because, you know, nobody was expecting anything, and the, all the family and the grandchildren were, were all around. So I went to him, I went to Lady Chilel, and then, yeah, she, she, for her, she accepted straight away. You know, my advice, started gathering, gathering the kids. This takes time, because it's a young, you know, toddler, some of them were. So... Do, do you know what he told the kids? Uh, Lady Chilel, I think they, they were told, they were even told that they were going to the board. I think they told them they were going to somewhere in uh, one of their families around uh, uh, half their area. They didn't tell them that they are going to the board. You know, so but hastily, in fact, I was trying to make them haste so that they can park whatever they can and get to the cars. Why did you do that? Because I thought uh, then what I was, you know, it's like you're thinking on your feet. If I can get the family out to the cars first, then if I come to the president, I'll be able to convince him this time. And at least, you know, for the sake of his family, like I did eventually, we should go and have be somewhere safe at the moment while we assess the situation, you know, as suggested by the vice president. And uh, what did you do after informing Lady Chilel yeah. about going to the boat? Uh, they all came down. It, it, took, it took a while to bring all of them down to the cars, you know, that were uh, laid downstairs and ready to, to depart. And like I said, whilst I was going downstairs, I met the chief driver, Pamal and uh, he said, uh, he said, Kasama, you cannot use a state, guy, a state car. I said, why? He said, they will recognize us. So I just laughed and then uh, passed by him. I said, don't you worry, we're not using your car. You know, so because already then the American ambassador's uh, car uh, was lined up for the president to use that. Do you recall what time of the day it was? Uh, this must be between 10 and 11, around that, because at that time, they were, the soldiers were at the bridge. You know, they, they were at the bridge already. Uh, whatever was happening at the bridge, I had no idea, but I know that they came that far. So this is why I had to haste and I tried to move them out of uh, uh, a state house and to the boat. At this stage, did you see the IGP, the then IGP, Pasal Lejang at state house? No, I couldn't remember seeing him, no. The permanent secretary, Minister of Defense, no, did you I see him at no. the airport? They would all be inside Sehu's office, like 
when I when I came in, there were so many. My focus was on the when I went to Seho's office. Straight away, I just walked straight to him. Everybody was sitting next by by, by in the in the sofas, so it's, it's him I address straight away. And then I didn't even have to sit down. And then when he said they are monitoring everything, I walked out. So I couldn't tell who and who uh, was sitting down with him there. You arrived at State House around 7.30 to 8. Yeah, between 7.30 to 8, yeah. Uh, between 8. You said as at the time the vehicles were parked downstairs yeah. waiting for Lady Chilel and the children to not come exactly, down. Not exactly at that time. The, the, the time they were parked... Hear, hear out the question first. Uh, by the time the vehicles were parked at the doors, waiting f or at the staircase, waiting for the Lady Chilel and the kids to come down, it was around 11 a.m. That's what you said, correct? Uh, about that. I'm not keep, I can't be able to say the exact timing, but I can only go by the events as they were going, uh -huh. because this was exactly at the time the soldiers were at uh, Denton Bridge. And it's your guess that it yeah. was around 11, correct? Around, yeah, between 10 and 11 around that okay. time. Oh. Between uh, the first time you saw Kababajo, around 7.30 to 8, and this period you call 11 or around 11 a.m., mm -hmm. did you see him again in between? No, I didn't see him. I did, that's why I said I didn't know what he was up to, what he was arranging, what he was organizing. I didn't know. I had no idea. How about Lang Tombong Tamba? Did you see him there at no, all? No, no, I haven't seen him. I think it's only Kaba I saw and I spoke to. At the moment. So, after you went down and you met uh, the driver, the chief driver of the president, and he told you what he said, and you re re responded that, no, you're not going to use his vehicles, what happened afterwards? Yeah, then the family were... But at the first place, I don't know who even actually arranged the convoy, the, the vehicle. I wasn't involved in uh, when they were laying, I mean, the, I mean, parking, ready to leave. You know, all I know is I was trying to get them. So by the time I, they, they came out, these vehicles were already down on the, uh, ready, ready to go. You know, I assume that uh, uh, the vice president having given me that instruction had already gone and done that, did that preparation. Whether Kaba was involved in arranging that one, I had no idea. You know, but eventually he was able to uh, join us uh, before uh, we left, uh, left State House at that point. How long did it take for Lady Chilel and the children to come down after you informed them? I would say uh, I, I, it took uh, quite, quite a while, you know, because these are families. You, can, you cannot just rush them like that. So about 20 to half an hour because uh, while they are all, when they are all on board, that's when I went back. Uh, to have uh, to talk to Sadara again. What did you tell him this time around? When I told him again, I have got the same answer. He's not going. He's still, he's not dressed. Uh, tell us what you told him, I and told then what he responded. Yeah, when I told him uh, we have, sir, we have to go. These people are the, the soldiers are at the bridge now, and you know, for your own security, uh, we have to go. He said he's not going. He was just. He was only wearing a singlet. You know this uh, uh, point. Uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, perforated thing that he was uh, wearing. He, didn't, he wasn't even dressed. And then he was resigned to his face, he's sitting down. I said, then I started to rationalize with him. I said, uh, your family, for the sake of your family, they are all in the car now waiting for you. We cannot keep, uh, put them at risk. You know, it's, it's better. It's not, uh, you, I told him, you are not leaving State House. It's just that we cannot defend it as it is now. The best option now is to go to the frigate whilst we assess the situation. You know, it was only at that point, and then he accepted to come. So I had to give him time, you know, to, to dress, get dressed, and then we leave. Did he pack any belongings? No, I mean, he didn't pack any belongings. Just his, I, can't, I, I can't remember him taking anything. Only get, got dressed, that's all. Briefcase, documents, nothing? Nothing I can't remember of that nature. I can't remember. And what happened after that, after he got dressed? Well, we went to the cars and we got into the, uh, uh, the ambassador's, uh, he used the ambassador's car and then uh, we left the convoy. Who was in the convoy, how long it was, I had no idea. All I knew is we were just uh, heading towards. Uh, 
In which car did you ride? With him in the ambassador's car. How about the ambassador? Uh, he was there in the car as well, yeah. The, the three of you and the driver? Yes. You tell us the route you, you took to go to the I frigate. Think, I think we went by, uh, no, 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 I forgot this, uh, Bokul or, I don't know, Hagan, I can't remember exactly. They, they will pass by the police station and going towards uh, the ferry uh, crossing, for the ferry terminal end to go to Port Authority. Which part of the police station? The custom end of police headquarters or the standard chartered end of police headquarters? I would say standard chartered end around that particular end. I can't be very specific about this uh, particular rule, but I thought we passed through there, because we passed through, I can remember definitely the terminal, and then uh, we went straight to, uh, to the boat. And tell us what happened when you arrived there. Yeah, when we arrived there, the entire family were taken to the lower deck uh, of the boat. Then uh, he stayed on the upper, upper deck, uh, there was a, a room for him, where he was with the vice president, and then uh, Bibi Davo. At what stage did Mr. Bibi Davo arrive? Or he, join, the, join the group? He somehow, I don't know, uh, by his own uh, account, uh, he was meant to go to uh, a marine unit. He was told to go to marine unit. Um, I think whether, whether the inspector general of police or the vice president told them to go to the marine unit where all the ministers should report. But then when he saw the convoy coming, his car somehow joined the convoy. You know, it was not uh, as pre-planned, like he was meant to join us. So he saw the convoy, so he joined the convoy. Um, do, you, you, do you have anything to show who went to the boat? I have a list of... Uh, Paragraph 27 of your statement, or after paragraph 27? Paragraph 28 yeah. of your statement? 28, yeah. We've got about 47 of us. That was a big number. <laughs> All of them were yeah. at State House. Well, this, some, some, not necessarily from St. Louis, because some were from Port Authority itself. Those who kind of, whatever reason felt probably uh, not safe enough, they just jumped on board. You know? Do you know how this list was prepared and by whom? Uh, this list was prepared by the vice president and then uh, given to Lady Chile. Um, which, uh, who, what, can you tell us the name of the vice president then? Uh, Sehu Sabali was the vice president then. He prepared this list while on board and then uh, uh, Lady Chile is still keeping this list. I see that the list is typed. Do you know how it came to be typed? Uh, list what again? It's typed. It's, it's typewritten. It's not handwritten. Oh, Do no, I'm know? not sure how, uh, how when, when, it was, uh, when it was typed, but then this is how it was given to me when I called Lady Chiller, who still had a, a copy of this uh, with her. Mm -hmm. Can you read out the names of the people who went on board? Uh, we have uh, slowly, please. <laughs> okay. Aja Hojasane, Ansusajo, Abu Jallo, Fatumata Jawara, Suleiman Sano, Mariam Jawara, Nadwa Basic, Maimuna Bojang, Cherno Jallo, uh, Omar B. Cham, Ramatullah Jawara, Ali Uketa, Chilel Sanyang, Njeme Jawara, that's uh, Lamin Bajo, that's Kaba Bajo, Bintu Job, Aisatu Baji, Husseinu Jawara, Sophie Bari, that's Lady Chilel Jawara, 
Baba Solomon, Demba E. Sanyang, that's uh, Fode Jawara, Mari Jawara, Mfali Jabang, Arabia Tusise, Malafi Sanyang, Jere Bojang, Sajo Jamme, Amadou Jallo, Malik Jang, uh, Sam Bach Samba, Ibrahim Sonko, Alaji Jaite, Pasal Lajang, Sadao de Jawara, Chilel Jawara, Ibu Ondu, Abduba, Ansumanan Dau, His Excellency Sadao de Jawara, Lady Chilel Jawara, Bakari Dabo, Honorable, Cherno Jata, uh, Captain Mamadou Kasama, Sehu Sabali H.E., Nasisa Jawara. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kasama. Uh, I noticed that uh, number 20 reads Chilel Jawara, but you read okay, it uh, out uh, as Lady sorry, Chilel the, Jawara. The, the, uh, yeah, I thought Lady Chilel, but yes, Chilel Jawara is the, one of the daughters of uh, Lady Njeme. And uh, number 42 would be Lady Chile Jawara. Jawara yes. uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, kindly tell us the events that took place in this boat when you arrived there. While on the boat, uh, the president wanted to find out uh, what's happening. Uh, because by this time, we learned that uh, we're just timely enough to leave State House because these soldiers were at uh, around Gambia High School, uh, where they temporarily camp. And then uh, the president asked me to call the Inspector General of Police to find out what their demands are. So I picked the, I picked the phone there, I had a phone there, and I called Pastor Rajan. I said, the president said, he would like you to go and find out exactly uh, what the demands of the soldiers are. You know, because up to this stage, it's still assumed to him it's a demonstration, like it happened before. So Pastor Lajan uh, said his exact words, I don't know Kasama, just stay put. So I relayed that message, and then Bibi Dabo next, sitting next to me was fuming with anger you know, that, uh, that will be kind of response coming from the commander of the force. You know, he said, what? I said, well, that's what he said. He said, stay put, I don't know. So I left it at that. Did you inform Pastor Lajain that you were on the boat? Okay, he knows already we are on the boat. Do you know how he knew you were well, on the boat? Now that um, first with the benefit, and now he informed me he's been he was the first informed by the vice president that he is taking the president to the board, which he advised against. So not that's not to my knowledge, but he told, uh, later told me that, you know, before we even left state house, the vice president had informed him that he is taking the president to the board. And how did what did he say was his reaction? His to that? advice was against that. So you are suggesting that he later told you that he was against taking the president to the boat. Yeah, that's what he told, uh, that's what he, that's what he uh, advised the vice president at the time. And uh, while you were at the boat, where was the U.S. ambassador? He's, the, he's with the president there, and uh, yeah, in the cabin with the president. From the list that you read, there were only two cabinet ministers present with the president at the board, correct? Yes. So at what stage were you asked by the president to call the IGP? As soon as we settled on the board, I think of course naturally he wants to find out information about actually what is this all about, you know. So we can get a, a feedback you know, uh, we, we already got a feedback. I'm not sure how we the cabal informed me that they are at, uh, uh, because so many things were happening at the same time, try to find more information. You know, I, at that point, I had spoken to Samsar again, 
but this time he was at Radio Gambia. You know, somebody gave me the number, I think it must be Kaba again. Uh, I spoke to Samsar, and then he described to me uh, how the soldiers were advancing to Banjul, how armed they were. What time of the day was this? Uh, we're still in the morning, you know, before, before uh, I would say around 11 or between 11 and 12, around that time. Did Sam Sar tell, tell you what he was doing at Radio Gambia? I didn't know how he got there. I didn't know Did how he, he got tell there. you what he was doing there? No, he didn't. Were you surprised by that? I was surprised because uh, uh, I didn't know what transpired between uh, going to Marine to get me support and then ending up at Radio Gambia. Whatever transpired, then I didn't know at the time. At this stage, was a coup announced, as far as you know? No, I had no announcement of a coup at that point. It was still in the morning, you said? It was still in the morning, yes. All right. And what happened after that? You had spoken to IGP. He asked you to stay put. You spoke to Sar. He told you that he was at Radio Gambia. What happened after that? Then uh, uh, they, they requested, uh, they, I think it was the board commander of the board, uh, I can't remember the name, but that I speak to the tactical commander. You know, so I sat down with him, with Bajo in attendance, and uh, I gave him a breakdown of how the size of our army, <coughs> how we are deployed throughout the country. <coughs> and I told him by the, my appreciation, the way they are moving and, uh, and, and the position they are claimed to have captured. To me, it will indicate that there are less than 40 soldiers advancing towards Banjul. So I, I told him that uh, this situation, can, we can deal with them. So, and At this stage, you have not yet left the port? No, we haven't uh, left the port yet. So we, ha we had that discussion. Uh, he must have relayed this thing to the uh, ambassador, because of course he has to get authorization. So I spoke to him. Uh, I, was, I, gave him I was in this particular briefing room uh, talking to him when I had, uh, not a commotion, but then I think uh, Pastor Lajan came on board. You know, you know I, I would rather say they, they, they had already agreed, because I told him during the briefing the best vantage point to be observing this would be opposite the State House. So if the board could leave where, where they are, and then we go and anchor opposite the State House, so they'll be able to monitor whatever is happening down there. So they already started their drills of uh, releasing the, the boat, I mean the, the frigate of the harbor when Pastor Lajani was brought in. So I saw him being uh, kind of handcuffed with his jacket, worn halfway backwards with his hand behind his back. And then uh, they asked me, they didn't know him. The American soldiers uh, holding him, they were bringing him to the, America, to the, the president's uh, cabin. So I said, no, no, that man is the IGP, the Inspector General of Police. Yeah, so they went in with him to the cabin. I didn't follow them there. So I stayed with the, uh, the tactical commander. What happened afterwards? Well, uh, whatever happened to Pastor Lajan, I didn't know at that time, until by his later account. And uh, you had made a suggestion that the best vantage point uh, would be to anchor opposite state house. Yes, we, we left. I, I understand he, he wanted to leave, but then the, 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 they, said, they said no. This was my understanding at that point at the, uh, from the, the, the Americans. Who they, wanted to leave? Pastor Lajan, because having delivered his message, this was my understanding that he wanted to leave. They told him no, already they left the harbor, so they cannot go back. But this was completely contrary to what he told me later happened, transpired. What did he say transpired? He said as soon as he walked into the cabin. Go ahead. He was told that uh, by the president that, oh, you are the leader. And then from then on, they took him and then locked him in a cell. And then what happened? That's all he for, said. For me, I didn't see him again until uh, uh, when uh, the, I think the following day in the evening. 
So I assume that uh, he is with the people downstairs uh, in the lower deck. So I didn't actually know about this particular incident. I had no idea he was uh, locked in a, in a cell because he's been accused of a leader. So I found it a bit odd that the uh, president, who didn't know about the coup until that morning, been briefed and didn't even believe it was a coup, for him to walk in straight away, sitting with the vice president, and for the president to say, you are the leader. Where did he get that information from? Uh, if, if that is actually what has transpired by his own statement. Did you discuss this with Sadada at any point? No, I didn't. I, didn't, I, got, I learned this uh, uh, not, not that long ago, but not at the point of uh, when I... Uh, Sadada at no point mentioned that particular incident to me. Uh, but uh, your testimony is that since Pastor Alajan walked, walked on board mm -hmm. and you saw him being brought by the Americans, you didn't see him again until the following day? Yes. So after the boat left port, you saw Salah, Pastor Salajan walk in. What happened after that? No, we left. Now we, the boat went around, as initially suggested, we went to uh, opposite state house, not far from, you know. Like one, 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 one thing also the commander told me, that they had about 71 Marines on board. And then they have amphibious uh, landing tanks. You know, the whole idea was if they can come down there and come, they can surround the state house and force these people to lay down their arms. Because I told him whatever they had is stronger than our entire army together. So that was the rationale behind going around that particular uh, opposite state house where they could land. I mean, if they release the tanks, they'll be able to surround the state house, whoever is there, by force and force them to lay their arms. They can stop this, whatever was happening at state house. Uh, at this stage, it seems that the, the discussion you had with the Americans was for them to intervene and stop the coup. Yes. Uh, do and, you and, and, Yeah. Please carry on. And they believe that they can. Did you, do you know whether Sadao discussed this prospect with the Americans? He was informed about it, yes. Do you know whether he made a request to the Americans? Not, a, not, no. I don't think we made a, 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 that, that particular request to the Americans. We, we just we had that discussion, and then uh, it must have transpired because I spoke to the commander. So naturally, I expect him to talk to the ambassador, you know, who would have given the go ahead for this particular maneuver to take place because he is the uh, de facto, you know, uh, U.S. president on board, uh, representing whatever. So he'll be the one giving the command, you know. So he would have informed. But I wasn't with the president, so I was with them. And then, so whatever transpired between him informing the president or whether the president make a personal request, I won't, I won't be aware of that. Okay, the vessel left port. Yeah, it so moved we were to there opposite uh, State House through their binoculars. You know, we can see virtually everybody in State House. Do you know? whether there were any negotiations with the soldiers at all? Not at that point uh, when we went up opposite uh, uh, the State House. At, the, at this moment, we were just uh, trying to uh, ascertain exactly you know, the situation in the State House. Do you know, during that time or subsequently, whether the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Defense, went to the bridge to talk to the soldiers? I have no idea what was happening on the ground. Do you know whether at that point or subsequently, whether in fact uh, some soldiers went to the bridge to negotiate with the, with the mutineers? Uh, no, I had no idea about that. While on board, you spoke to, you claim you spoke to two people. Did you speak to anybody else other than Captain Samsudin Sar and uh, this person? Uh, what's Pasala, his? Uh, Pasala Pasala Jain. Pasala Jain, yes. Yeah, and the only third person I would uh, I, I spoke to was in the following day. Saturday was General Dada. Nobody else, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Do you know whether Sadauda called anybody? 
at all. From Friday night, I understand he was talking to the Senegalese, you know, about uh, <clears throat> the possibility of uh, giving, giving him sanctuary there or possibility of helping as well. You know, he was uh, from Friday night going to Saturday, these negotiations were going on. Abdujouf. Uh, we, we will come to that. Okay. Uh, for now, let's focus on this Friday morning to the afternoon. You left, you are now anchored somewhere op opposite State House. You were able to see what was going on in State House. Yeah. How were you able to see? Can you? Oh, they have that? very powerful binoculars, you know, they are on the on this thing, so you can watch, you can, you can look, uh, which we try to see exactly what's happening on the ground. Uh, and tell us what exactly, did you, did you in fact look into those yeah, binoculars? Yes, you can see people walking, you know, ca just at the counter, just walking around, you know, nothing extraordinary. Dancing you know. Bukharabu? <laughs> well, not necessary to that level, but then, uh, yeah, in police uniform, in all kind of mixtures, uh, working on the on the ground, so there was no order to it. He didn't invent that. That was the testimony that when they went in there somewhere dancing Bukhara, so I yeah, didn't I invent had, that. I heard that too, you know, he was dancing on the, the president's bed. I heard that too as well, yeah. And for how long were you anchored of facing State House? We were there about, for, I think, the second day, that's when... Until the second until day? Until the second day, yes. While you were there, you were watching soldiers moving up and down. Uh, can you tell us what was going on inside the, inside the boat? From my own perspective, I, I thought uh, the purpose of coming down there was for this amphibious thing to land. So why it is not happening, I wasn't sure. So I was going up and down to find out you know, if there's any movement there. So I went, uh, one of those going up, I saw the American ambassador talking and, uh, on the phone. As soon as he saw me, saw me approach, he stopped talking. Okay, it's, uh, that kind of f fell odd to me. So I went down stairs. Just a few seconds, I walked back up again. I approached him, he stopped talking. At that point, you know, I was like suspicious of anything that will delay the whole action of soldiers being deployed that they had on board. So I went to the president straight away. I said, look, I said, sir, I don't trust the American ambassador, you know. He, sa he said, why? I said, well, I explained to him what happened. You know, I said, uh, twice I got to him, and then whatever he is saying, he doesn't want me to know. You know, to me that sounds a bit uh, uh, dubious. And then the sadder told me, you know, the sadder gave me a long lecture about international relations, how America will, they will force condemn the school, and then they will impose sanctions and before they authorize action. You know, I wasn't convinced, you know, I, but he, he, very, very, he, was, he has been very calm throughout. You know, he, at no point was he angry or out of control. You know, he maintained his dignity throughout. You know. Do you know what discussions took place among the cabinet ministers who were present at the time. I'm not aware of any discussion that actually took place in between them. Uh, like I said, I'm, I've been moving, you know, from uh, uh, point A to point B, I uh, try to see what's happening. The main purpose of our deployment in that particular area. Do you know whether the American ambassador take any, took any steps to, to secure U.S. intervention, approval for U.S. intervention? I wasn't aware at the time that he made such uh, intervention. To me, as far as I was concerned, I saw it as a hostage situation later on because I, I, I could see it develop, you know, why the ship is not uh, deployed, Did, what, what's the delay? I didn't know and it wasn't communicated to me back. What, no, do, what do you mean by a hostage Situation? Can you explain that? Well, uh, like I said, uh, my like I, said, I had my opinion regarding the. It's my own personal opinion about the American ambassador. What was your opinion and about you know, the American ambassador? That uh, in his person is a person who interfered uh, or was deemed to have interfered in the internal politics of the country, 
I remember at a time, there was a time he wrote an, an article on the Observer uh, criticizing the government about the pace of the AMRC, the Asset Management and Recovery Program, and its pace, uh, virtually implying that whoever is uh, accused, you know, irrespective of due process, uh, should be just be, uh, you know, dealt with, you know, you can say unfairly. I understand, so, I mean, Sadara called him and then uh, 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 virtually told him to not to interfere. I said, America has the long duress, longest duration of court sittings in history. So you must allow, you cannot just accuse somebody, you know, and then you expect uh, that person to be just summarily uh, tried. So you must allow the person to defend himself. He came to say, I was aware of that particular incident. So at this moment in time, you know, my decision was informed about all those put together you know, whatever is happening, he is kind of being an obstacle for not allowing this particular deployment to take place, which I was assured by the commander that they can, and I know they had the capability that they can stop whatever was happening in the country. I wasn't aware that he actually made that request uh, to uh, US or Pentagon, whatever process. To put it bluntly, you suspected the American ambassador yes, as at not that, being at that, point, at that point in time, yes. Whatever was happening, I suspect him to be part of it. At this stage, it was confirmed to you that this was a coup, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. So, and what happened afterwards? After you spoke to Sadauda and he gave you this, what you called an unconvincing lecture, yeah. as to how Americans would deal with this particular situation. Not, not, not that I doubt what he explained, but then uh, uh, being a soldier, my, 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 my uh, instinct uh, where, you know, here is an opportunity uh, to nip this in the bud now. So I couldn't understand. Of course, of course I am green when it comes to uh, international protocols or relations. I don't know anything. I, can, I didn't question his... Uh, 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 rationalization of the situation, but I thought uh, at the bare minimum, not to fight, but if you can surround it and wait for others to come, not necessarily wait for others to come before we come down. And this was actually my understanding of the situation uh, before we got uh, opposite uh, uh, State House. And the fact that it's taking that long, the longer it takes, the more I started, I begin to lose hope. So, of course, by the time uh, the boat arrived opposite State House. Soldiers were already at they State House. They were already House. at State House, yes. So you could see them going up and down. Yes. From what you saw, how organized were they? Very disorganized. Uh, I didn't see any organization at all. You can see people walking across. I, I, I can't even remember seeing people were with, like gun totting or you know, brandishing their guns. No, people are just walking, you know. It's a kind of a very a confused situation, if you can call that. But I don't see, like, soldiers particularly guarding heavily everywhere in kind of no order to the system. I thought that was the time, you know, for the, uh, to the landing to happen, and then we could have nipped it in the bud then, there and then. Uh. Do you know what steps Americans, whether the, the, the commander of the American vessel took any steps to prepare for deployment in the event that he received an order? Well, I, I understand later, of course, they were opening the belly of, because we cannot see that we are on board, you know, kind of uh, chattingly opening the belly and then closing uh, kind of as a kind of a scare tactics that was in the idea, but then it still did scare the the soldiers anyway. But we, I cannot see that I'm on board. But this was later on I came to uh, uh, learn of this particular uh, maneuver or tactics they were using. How do you know it scared the soldiers? Well, they, they made a request that they don't want the boat uh, close enough to State House. They want us to go more in, inwards in the sea. Tell us what happened later on in the day, up to the evening. Uh, the following day, Saturday? For the following day. In the, uh, in the, the afternoon and the evening, what, if, what happened, if any? Um, 
No, I know, I know we had uh, the communication line, but it was, well, that was the following day. But that particular evening, I'm not sure exactly uh, anything significant happened. Do you know whether Sardauda was able to talk to any of the neighboring uh, countries, any president in, in the neighboring Friday countries night, on that day? Yes. Yeah, from Friday night, they started negotiating uh, about the possibility of going to uh, uh, Senegal, you know, uh, as a, a refugee or to give us sanctuary there, you know, on fr from Friday night. And I understand that was refused by the Senegalese. But the Gambia had, for the longest time, enjoyed a defense pact with Senegal. Yeah. Did Sadauda make a request for Senegalese intervention, as far as you know? Not when I was present, of course. I came to learn uh, this later, uh, and this one was torn down. <clears throat> At this point, I just want to bring, uh, if I can bring... Uh, I com uh, just to compare exactly from some of the statements I had here, I thought it's relevant. Uh, I found the Senegalese position, why I found the Senegalese position a bit odd. Uh, it's, been, it's been narrated here by uh, Mohamed Chang that uh, when he spoke to the Senegalese, General One, they were, they were at the border at the time, they came to help the Gambia by his own chest thumping or bragging, as I would want uh, to plan it, okay, yes. or by the, his own explanation that he stopped them because he told them that they had about 330,000 uh, Senegalese here. If they do, he cannot guarantee their safety. At the same time, reminding them of what happened in 1981. Now, this is Senegal coming to help. Now, if somebody's that prepared to come to help, within 24 hours, the mere fact of receiving you and they refuse. I, I found it a bit odd. I was saying then something sinister to me, to my mind, must have been offered. Because you don't want to help somebody you, with your troops, putting their lives in line to help the country. Next minute, you will refuse to, uh, even refuse that, to, to receive that person in your country. I found that really very odd. Uh, uh, Mr. Gassama, I understand the point that you are trying to raise. Yes. Um, I do not want us to engage in a no, polemic. No, no, I, I, thought this way, I, thought, I just thought at this particular point uh, it's, it's relevant just for, for food for thought. And then uh, I yes, uh, think about it. Obviously, that, yeah. there, would, there can be lots of explanations. I know, it I is, know. It is possible that Mr. Cham referred to a conversation <laughs> with General Wan. Uh, we don't even know whether General Wan had already made a decision mm -hmm. that Senegal would come and help. This is just a conversation he claims to have had with General Wan. Whether it is true or not, or the extent or content of the conversation is neither here nor there. But the point, the important point you make is that Senegal, from the highest authorities, we are not interested in helping at all. At is, all. is that the statement yeah. you want to make? Yes. Uh, regardless of anything else anything we they have. They don't want to see Jawara in, in, in uh, Sadawda and his delegates in Senegal. What exactly was it Sadawda was asking for from Senegal? Can you tell us? Well, thanks, because uh, my understanding, of course, the U.S. wanted uh, the boat to return, and they want to start out to come off the boat at some point. And then uh, the only place they can go to, the next door neighbors, is Senegal. So that's what he, that's what they asked for, you know, uh, initially as a sanctuary. So it had to, my understanding is later on, it had to take the, uh, the U.S. government from there, and then the U.S. embassy in Dakar, by the intervention of Ambassador Winters, appealing to these both institutions to prevail on Senegal, at least to accept uh, receiving Saadara in Senegal. And then they laid down their conditions. You know. What were the conditions? That they will allow him to come so long as he does not engage in anything in trying to get back to power. At what stage did this happen? Was it while you were still anchored, facing uh, state house, or was it after you departed 
uh, the state, it, the it state was, house it, area? It, it began from Friday night. It was an ongoing process. You know, Friday night going through Saturday and then Sunday, you know, before they finally accepted, come to an agreement. It was an ongoing process. So you're telling us that it took a minimum of three days to convince Senegal to accept Jassar Dauda and his entourage. Yes. So, okay, let's take it then gradually, step by step. Uh, you said while you were anchored there, word was received from the soldiers requesting that the vessel be moved away from facing State House. Yeah. That's what you said, right? Yes. Okay, what happened after that information, that request was received? Yeah, we moved back towards up till about around uh, opposite Cape Point and around Cape Point where the boat anchored. You know, we stopped around that and but we moved. You know, again, this confirmed my suspicion at that time. I was said whatever is happening is being aided by the American ambassador at the time. That was just a suspicion. That's just a suspicion. That's that is my, just a theory. Yeah, my, my theory by my own thinking, yes, at the time. And in fact, the American ambassador also has his own theory. Yes. And you must have read about that theory. Yes. And he blamed other people in government for organizing the coup. Yes. Uh, and uh, that suggested, it's self-serving, but it suggested that the Americans were blindsided, they didn't know anything. They, 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 in his own words, we've been hard. So what I'm trying to drive at here is that there are several theories. Absolutely. And unless there is special investigations about that, it would be difficult to, to know the truth about what exactly happened. I believe this commission can establish that. Uh, uh, well, we, the commission would not necessarily uh, devote its time to that. Uh, I mean, its mandate is to find out and investigate the human rights violations that occurred from uh, July 22nd onwards. What we are doing here is trying to get a contextual information, background information as to what happened. Uh, obviously, all these things are interesting, and the Commission is indulging you and hearing you on that. But uh, one may see it as a red herring. I'm not uh, going to uh, really uh, belabor that point. Uh, but it suffices to say that there are lots of theories yes, as to who was involved and who was not involved. Yes. Okay, but the bottom line remains that ultimately the coup makers announced themselves, correct? Yeah. And who were they? Uh, Ed, Ed, Edward Singate, to me, Bachelor was in charge. Uh, that's, uh, he, he's the one I saw as being, he's the one communicating with Sadawla. You know, so uh, at that mo moment in time, you know, yeah, Jamie didn't feature that much as uh, somebody who will be in charge of uh, tomorrow, at least from what we were getting. So it was Edward Singate who was communicating uh, with Sadara on the, on, on the board, so I took him to be the leader then. Uh, at what stage did he communicate, first communicate with, the, with this Sadara? Was this was on a Saturday. Around five, five in the uh, in the evening, when they established communication, and then he had communication uh, through the uh, the frigate uh, with uh, Sadawa. Were you present during that communication? I was present briefly, not throughout the entire of the uh, the entirety of the communication. At the big initial beginning of uh, when uh, the their demand was. Uh, that Sadara can come back, as Edward was talking. He was talking, being very respectful. Were they making a demand, or were they responding to a demand? No, well, the, they were, through the communication, uh, of course, it's a two-way two -way, uh, two -way route, uh, was saying that, Sadara, sir, you can come back as an elder statesman, you know, but nothing will happen to you. You know, Sadara was saying that you can go back to the barracks, you know, I promise you that, you know, absolutely, you will all be forgiven. You know, nothing will happen to them. So he was kind of uh, uh, pleading with them to go back to the barracks. For how long did that conversation take place? It wasn't long, uh, 10, 15 minutes, not, 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 not long. We were throwing and throwing, you know, so it wasn't that long. And uh, 
what was the outcome? Well, it was a deadlock. You know, they wouldn't, uh, Sadara would not come on those terms. You know, he was insisting that they must go back to barracks. And he promised them that, you know, absolutely, they would all be forgiven, whatever they've done, you know, but then they must go back to barracks. Correct me if I'm wrong. At this stage, Sadawda still harbored hopes or expectations that he could come back to Gambia as president. Yeah, he could persuade them to go back, that they probably they don't know what they're doing, you know, so they should go back uh, to barracks. Yeah, and then he promised them that kind of immunity, nothing will happen to them. Who was present during this conversation? I, don't know. I remember Bibi Dabo was there, you know, but I can't remember the vice president. Who else was present? Uh, the U.S. ambassador was there. The commander of the ship? Yes, was there as well, yeah. Did but the commander went because uh, during their conversation with Peter, and then I remember he made a remark that you know, this boy is sharp, you know, because of the accent. So uh, who I was he? Was who was he referring to when referring he said? Was referring to Edward Singate. I was. I was just. I just told him that his, his mom is British. Anyway, what do you expect? You know. I, I was kind of annoyed with that command, if you can, because in the, under the circumstances, uh, I, I didn't want to convey any kind of compliment to them. And uh, what happened after that? Yeah, uh, after that then, you know, it was a, a slow drift, a very painful one, you know, uh, away from the source of uh, the country. And then uh, I, you know, I that we had uh, still about four Marines which went uh, in the country, I mean, somewhere, you know, we left behind. I think they were waiting for those people to come. And they must have come from the American ambassador's residence to come and join us by a boat uh, to come uh, before we left for, for Dakar. What happened to the American ambassador? He came off before we went to Dakar, uh, having secured whatever negotiation he, he had done with uh, Senegal. He came off the boat, and then the boat proceeded to Dakar. Do you recall which date, which day that was? This was on Sunday. Um, what happened to P.S. Jang? He stayed on board. I remember he wanted to go off uh, with the American ambassador, and he was refused that uh, uh, opportunity to come down. Did he say why he wanted to go down? Well, at that moment in time, no, I didn't have any conversation with him why he wanted to go home, go, go, go down. Do you know of any particular reason why the Senegalese government accepted to, to, to receive Sadauda and his entourage in Senegal? That is, if he accepts the condition that uh, he can come and stay in Senegal without involving in any activity, political or anything otherwise, in trying to get him back to power. It's a kind of a refugee status, uh, status you know. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion uh, that the Americans insisted on going to Senegal regardless of the lack of approval simply because they had somebody on board who was sick and needed immediate medical assistance? To me, at that time, I thought it was a ploy you know, to get us down. Once, once they get down there, you know, the negotiator, that's, I, that's how I saw it at the time, because I wasn't privy to other information. You know, so when they said there was a uh, soldier sick, I didn't even know it was a hard person. I thought, now here, here again, they're trying to find a way, an excuse to dump us in Senegal. So you still had this conspiracy theory yes, in your head? I still had this uh, conspiracy, uh, you know, in, uh, in my head that definitely uh, here is they find an excuse because uh, the ship of that magnitude uh, will be well sufficiently stocked with med me medical facilities. You know, if you have a knowledge of military, uh, you know, and as ad ad advanced a country, one of the most advanced countries in the world, would have virtually every means of uh, uh, treatment within their uh, on board the frigate. So I assume that this was a ploy to me uh, to take us to Senegal and then leave us there. Uh, just a matter of interest, was there a helicopter on board? I couldn't remember. 
No, I can't remember seeing a helicopter. I couldn't. So when you said you then started a painful drift, drift towards where? Towards Senegal. When did you reach in Senegal? When did you arrive? It was a Sunday, the same Sunday. You know, I can't remember the exact time we were in the evening or something like that. We arrived there Sunday and then uh, we found vehicles were arranged there, were laid out for us. So we hastily. Uh, presidential treatment? To No, I won't issue not presidential at all. Absolutely not. You know, it was all rushed. So, so we were taken to uh, residence Medin. More uh, like incognito, you know, you, you have to go so that uh, you will not be recognized or something. So, while you were on board, did you at any time talk to the leadership of the army? I spoke to General Dada, and that was the second day. And I call him, um, just to find. Then, then I think we all realized that you now we can now. Many people were making calls from their uh, mobile phones, so I had a bit of uh, life left in my battery. So I call him, and then uh, he said, uh, "The boys, his exact time was the boys, meaning the soldiers. They've passed by me, and I've told them what to do, what not to do, especially not to touch the civilians." So I, at the time, I felt so disappointed because I thought that was giving a helping hand you know, to whatever was happening. But at that time, I didn't know the depth of his involvement uh, in the whole coup plot at that time. Are you suggesting that Dada was involved in Ab the coup plot? Absolutely. What is your basis for that? Because uh, I, I, like, uh, at the end of this uh, whole thing, I, I kept on investigating and then uh, Officers, uh, uh, we will kind of have uh, uh, confide in each other, you know, what actually transpired at different points because everybody have their own perspective of what was happening. So when I put everything together, uh, I knew he was uh, an aggrieved general who was relieved to go back into Nigeria and he refused to go. And uh, in his own words, as he told me, that they've messed up the country uh, in, that means Nigeria, but then not realizing that uh, that kind of was used, you know, in the, in the theory I had, uh, that uh, uh, he was uh, offered citizenship if he could pull this thing off to that level. Ultimately, he wasn't offered citizenship, was he? Well, of course, it didn't, well, uh, uh, it didn't succeed probably in the way or whoever offered him a citizenship, uh, the way, the manner it, it happened. But I understand from, uh, because we got one of our orderlies who was Alpha Jalo, stayed at the State House. Immediately they got into the State House, Dada walked in there. You know, he was, he was coming in and out of the State House. That is the information you That's the information I got from, yeah. Yes. But nonetheless, this theory is punctured by the fact that the coup has succeeded yes. and Dada wasn't given citizenship yes. and he had to go back to Nigeria. Yes. So it's just another theory. Another, yeah, another theory. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so Dada seemed to convey, you seem to suggest that Dada was still in Gambia yeah. at the time of the coup. Yes. That is the following day when I spoke to him, and I called him, and he, he picked up his phone. I, I don't think in those days the phones can, I don't have any international facility to call anything, so it can only be domestic. <clears throat> and I called him, it was domestic. What do you say to the suggestion that Dada had gone to Nigeria and he only returned the next day after the coup? Yeah, that's the next day, that's when I called him, that was a Saturday. I'm not, I'm not aware whether he had traveled. All I knew is he refused to go when he was called back. Uh, I had no knowledge that he had traveled to Nigeria the day before. But then uh, when I called him, he was in the country. So that second day, you continued to drift until you arrived in Senegal on Sunday, and you were taken on Kignito to your residence in Medin, right? Yeah. So can you tell us what happened there? 
Well, when we got down there, the, uh, everybody gathered together. The president called everybody together. And then he, uh, as uh, traditionally, recited Fatiha. All, all 47 of you? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, he ref uh, 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 recited Fatiha, prayed for everybody, and thanked them and asked them to return to their families. Did he expect everybody to leave? No, he expected his immediate entourage with him. I mean, like the people who normally will be with him, the guards, and the protocol. Uh, and in this particular incident, he expected even Pastor Lajang to stay with us. Yeah. And what happened after? Oh, he said he has to go back. Who uh, said he, he has Pastor to go Lajang, back? He took permission to go back. Uh, so that, uh, when I told him, informed him about that, he said, well, if he goes back, they might think that we are, off, we are up to something here, and they will torture him. This was his exact words. It's not safe for him to go back. Well, I said, you know, he said he wants to go back. He's a commander of the force. You know, well, he said, uh, if that is the case, he insists on going, and uh, they say he can go, but then uh, he will advise against that. Advise against that? The president, yes. Do you know when Pasala left? I think he left in the, that very evening. The following day, he was back uh, to his office. And then uh, when we heard that uh, upon return he was arrested, he just he said the same thing. He, was, he lamented the fact that only, if only had he stayed back, you know, because this was something he was anticipating would happen to him, because naturally these people would be curious uh, the way he was rationalizing as to what is happening from Dakar end. Who else left soon after? Uh, soon after, not, 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 uh, not immediately. It took a few days before the, uh, uh, the chief of protocol left. Who was he uh, at the time? It was uh, Ibn Dur. And, uh, and who else left? And then uh, Kababajo also left. And what, what was his reason for leaving? I don't know. I had two versions of it. What he told me, and uh, I understand he told the president that his dad is, had a stroke and is ill, and then uh, yeah, he had to go back basically to look after his dad. But uh, what he told me was, you have uh, this, as far as back home is concerned, everything has been sanitized for him. You know, he can go. Like uh, Tatin Baji, you know, they've done the groundwork for him to go. So the part about his dad illness I didn't know at the time, but of course that's what he told the president. I wasn't aware of that. So when he said he was going, I said, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I am staying uh, with the president. Uh, by, by that time, already they made, started making this accusation of corruption. I said, uh, if I actually believe in what these people are saying, I'll be the first person to leave uh, the president. I said, but whatever they're labeling against him, uh, you know and I know the type of person we're serving. I said, I'm not going. And uh, the vice president and the minister of finance, they also decided to stay. He was with us for a while. Yes, uh, he was with us for a while. You know, Who uh, was with you uh, for I mean, a while? So, I mean, so you said the vice president, say that again? Okay, the vice president stayed. Yes, he stayed. He was staying at Hotel Taranga. Again? He was staying at Hotel Taranga. We were staying at Hotel, uh, I mean, uh, we were staying at Residence Medin. And uh, he stayed until you left for England? Yes, he was with us throughout until we left for England, yes. We want to know the relationships and the, the situation as it, as it obtains there uh, during this period, relationships. What was it like? Between who and who? The president and the members of his entourage. I, I didn't see anything untoward uh, uh, between them. Uh, basically, it happens to be in an area where my brothers were born and I had my siblings. It's not far from uh, the residence. Uh, my stepmom, uh, Musuke Basonko, my, well, my auntie, my mom's elder sister, they are of the same mother, uh, was living there. 
My mom wasn't there at the time, but she was. So this is where we would go for food. You know, she would be cooking for us, you know, throughout our, our stay down there. So every day, you know, we'll go and then bring food. And they will come normally. Uh, we'll have meetings uh, to take stock of what has happened. And sometimes we will have uh, Mustafa Nyas, the foreign minister, you know, coming uh, to brief them, uh, whether any action or any action from the Senegalese government side, until they arrange, uh, we arrange a trip to go and visit Abdujouf. Let's talk about first the meetings that you had to take stock about what happened. What can you tell us about those meetings? Well, it's about the. I won't, at that moment in time, you know, as far as my role is concerned, you know, uh, let's say security wise, because I still defer, if you can call it uh, that. They, they can have their tete a tete, I won't get involved in that. So, like, I'm still more professional as a soldier. Now, I don't, I would tend to, when they are talking there, they're having their, uh, their meetings, I won't take part in that. So I'll be more like looking after the family, family side of this, because I become like, you know, multiple roles, you know, try to calm down the situation, uh, make sure everybody is uh, at ease, you know. So when they are there, he, it will be him and maybe uh, the two, three of them talking, you know, but I'm not privy Who are the other two? particular discussion in between them. Who were the other two? You said three of them uh, yeah, is the vice talking. Yeah, the president and Bibi Dabo. We are there in Sadauda, and then the chief of protocol was there as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's five minutes to the lunch break, so you may have the floor to ask questions if you so choose. Thank you very much, uh, my council, um, for that. Um, I wonder if any commissioner has got any question to ask. Um, uh, uh, commissioner Carr, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Carr. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that you've interacted with Jamme. Um, did you notice any notorious uh, uh, behavior or attitude um, in him? Anybody, anybody who knows Jamme, you know, even in the Zandam, how ill-disciplined he was. Uh, he is something that will not defer to authority. You know, because he built this uh, mythology about himself being uh, the son of uh, a Kanilai thing, and then he had a kind of a following. You know, because I knew this when I was with the Armed Forces football team. You know, one of the footballers, I think Sirik Sanyang, broke his leg, and then he claimed to have the means to be able to fix that with, other, with whatever mystic ways, and it didn't turn out to be so. But, but nonetheless, uh, he had this kind of uh, mysticism about him that uh, you will find the likes of Musa Jammi and their uh, ilk uh, will clung around with him because of that. You know, he will not uh, uh, defer to authority. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, uh, Deputy um, Chair. Thank you. Uh, when you were reading out the list, an important member of the household was not named. <coughs> this was Lady Njeme. Where was she? She was in, uh, I think she was uh, in UK. She was in the, she was in, uh, the, uh, in the country by then. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Kinte. Commissioner Kinte. Um, this is a, a great experience for all of us, all Gambians, mm, that uh, Yaya's emergence was a result of negligence um, because there were enough indicators that this man needed to have been tamed well before <coughs> the occurrences. So um, that's one lesson we have learned that uh, he's, he succeeded because a lot of people, the, 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 the institution was negligent the individuals in the play, most of them were negligent and they took a lot of things for granted. And the gentleman 
uh, well, I'm, I wouldn't call him a dear gentleman, but the uh, bully had to take advantage of that to take up and mess us all this way. It's seriously regrettable. What are your points? My, my point is, uh, as some people might have alluded to it here, Yaya didn't have the capacity you know, to start and organize this thing. He was a tool. You know, this is my theory, and then as my subsequent colleagues will come uh, to confirm, uh, because of it, that daring audacity, uh, he was used with, along with others. That's my theory. So, uh, involving in some, some senior officers as well, because the, the, the conspiracy, as far as I'm concerned, is deeper than that. But the fact that he had the audacity, and then along with his, uh, yes, uh, it was to me an error of judgment by his command, and that they could have reined him in earlier, you know, with all the chances they had. You know, if a soldier is disciplined, there is no way you can cover it, and then uh, in whatever kind of loyalty you have, your loyalty first and foremost should be to the constitution of the country. I mean, you are here to defend the constitution. So it's not look about any personal uh, relations as far as that's, that's concerned, especially if it's a threat to the country. Yeah. But then, yeah. Um, Commissioner Kaur, you have a question? Or? Yes. Sorry. Uh, something I wanted to ask, but uh, it escaped me for one reason or the other. I have a second question. You, from my understanding of your, uh, of your testimony, you said that um, the Americans, well, that was your own interpretation. Uh, for one reason or the other, uh, we are in support of the coup, if I got you right. But of course, uh, if I can qualify that, that was at the time. Okay. Yeah, but subsequently, of course, I came to know better. Okay. You know, but at the time, you know, there is no way of me, without any sufficient information available to me, I made those uh, judgments. You know, up to the time we went to Hayward's Heath. You know, we sat down, we started to recap, exactly, we sat down, uh, how events went through, one by one. And then uh, everything seemed odd. Here is a U.S. boat, I mean, that came to the country. He, you are the commander-in-chief. You didn't know about it. There is an exercise. You didn't know about it. This exercise was meant to take place in Mandinari. Last minute, it was changed to be an assault on Banjul, giving the soldiers chance to attack Banjul. He didn't know about it, you know? And I was told to remove him in State House as uh, the instruction given to me. He, he refuted that, that form. So this set of circumstances, you know, I came to le know later. You know. I, I just have a, a follow-up because you also mentioned that at some point they wanted him back. Uh, they wanted Jawara back, if I got you right. Yes, but That's only the, as an elder statesman. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Paduko, you wanted the floor? Yes. Please, um, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Modulam in Gazama. On the, the morning of July 22nd, when you went to work and uh, you had these rumors, you went to the vice president, who was then the minister of defense, to brief him on the matter. And then he told you already that um, they had about it and they were working to contain the situation. And Monitoring. Then, they were monitoring the situation. Yeah. Uh, you met the American ambassador and uh, the commander of uh, the American frigate. Um, the, is it not a surprise for you to hear that at that very early hour of the morning that the vice president and minister of defense to say that they had about something like that and they were monitoring uh, the, the situation. Well, yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, you can say, because uh, he wasn't meant to be in Banjul in the first place. He was meant to go uh, to his brother's uh, funeral, uh, as I later learned. That's why he wasn't at the airport. You know, but then, by, apparently, he was in the state house by 7 a.m. So how that happened, I don't know. You know, whether ferries can travel from 6 a.m. to get to Banjul, I don't know. But then uh, that was what uh, was alleged at the time. So, yeah, uh, everything was strange, you know. Everything was strange. Uh, Thank you, Imam C. 
Kubisona Ivan C. Mr. Kasama, Mang Laila, again the Kiji Galbi, Nangan the Kiji. I want to ask you when you were in the boat. Again, Bare, Nangan Dundeon, accepted Dwight. Did you leave? What were the conditions like given the huge number that was involved for these two days? Nahari on the top. Because so you say, so say the hurricane amini amga. Because when you look at the people's faces, the fana hari won torap. They did not look. The fa even though naka gabiyatuna, why the fa hala ginana hat. The ship was wide, but to us it was small. I was looking to one of my friends. When I look at the faces. I noticed uh, he was not happy, and you know, I can still uh, remember that to this day. You know, time definitely, situation in the At that time, the situation was really, really not uh, very good. Thank you. Mr. Kazama, you had indicated or said very clearly that one of the conditions imposed by the Senegalese for president to be allowed him in Senegal was not to do anything mm -hmm. to try to return to power yeah. here. Did that term of prohibition apply regionally or that he was not to do anything uh, within the Gambia uh, to try to come back here? Uh, the question I want to ask him relating to that is whether or not you're aware of any attempts that the president made with other regional leaders uh, in the West Africa subregion. Uh, Mr. Chair, that was supposed to be the subject of the next session, but uh, <laughs> perhaps maybe he should wait until after the lunch break and then he would answer that. Because the answer is a bit long, knowing that I have the information, the answer is a bit long. So perhaps we'll ask him whether he'd prefer to answer now or after lunch. Well, the choice is yours. Um, I, I think I'll defer to the um, legal counsel. I always try to preempt you. Sorry, Thank you. Sorry about Thank you. So we can wait. Um, uh, but but we can to... still leave it as your question, Mr. Chair. <laughs> no, I, I would want it to be yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, that's um, uh, good enough. If there are no further questions, we will take a one-hour break and then come back. Uh, 2.30 sharp. The meeting is adjourned.